my name is Rajan Mitra, and today I'll be giving you a walking tour of Great Neck Plaza. I decided to make this tour as residents are largely unaware of the deep and rich history the town offers, with many passing by buildings every day without knowing of the stories. Great Neck was first settled by the Mattencock people who named the peninsula Wallage. Native Americans referred to the peninsula as Manhattan Ock, which they shortened to Madnan Ock. This was later interpreted by white settlers to be Madnan's Neck, which became the name for the peninsula for centuries. However, by the 1750s, townspeople began to refer to the area as Great Neck, referring to the size of the peninsula. In 1664, the peninsula was surrendered by its local governor, Peter Stuyvesant, to the British, who controlled it for the next 118 years. During this time period, there was an increased emphasis on farming and grist mills, which became an integral part of community life. Schooling also developed, with both local and private schools created during this period. During the early stages of the revolution, the town of Hempstead was divided, with the northern half of which Great Nick was a part supporting independence and the southern half opposing it. Due to this, North Hempstead seceded in 1775 and formed its own government, of which exists today, North Hempstead and Hempstead having never reunited. Although Great Neck was never a location for battles, Great Neckers did participate in the war, with many engaged in guerrilla activities against the English. After independence was achieved, Great Neck immediately began to recuperate from the devastating effects of the war. Agricultural life returned to normal, and residents settled into an era of prosperity. The next century was one of prosperity for all Great Neckers, with residents largely unaffected by events that disrupted the whole nation. Starting in the late 19th century, Great Neck began to witness an influx of wealthy into the town, among the first being William Russell Grace. The Graces owned a large portion of what is now called Great Neck Plaza, and they expanded and developed the area. Louis and Roswell Aldridge were also residents during this time period, owning in the entirety of Saddle Rock, the only family village in the nation. Other famous residents included Walter Chrysler, Eddie Cantor, and the Marx Brothers. In the following decades, Great Neck developed into a bustling community, with residents from many countries drawn to the town, forming the Great Neck of today. The auto dealership at 124 South Middle Neck Road first opened in 1931, coincidentally in the same year that its village, the village of Thomaston, was incorporated. It originally functioned as an auto showroom for Chrysler's and their subdivisions, Plymouth and DeSoto. However, it later transitioned to an Oldsmobile dealership, which was run on the Belgrave Motors. After Belgrave moved locations, the building became a Ford dealership, which remained as until 2019, when it became a Birner pre-owned center. Having provided automobiles to Great Neck residents for over 90 years, it has marked Great Neck's development into a bustling suburban community. Now, we're gonna go south, down South Middle Neck Road and take a turn onto Barstow. The New York Telephone Building, built in 1929, reflected the latest architectural styles. The building originally served as an office for the New York Telephone Company and was designed to serve as Great Neck, Port Washington, Manhasset, and the Imperial Central Office District. Effort was also made in the design of the building to ensure that design conformed to the high-class residential character of Great Neck and to preserve the trees on the site. It has remained a location for telecommunications, currently serving as an office for Verizon. The building was designed by architect Ralph Walker, who notably designed One Wall Street and 100 Barclay, the longtime headquarters of the New York Telephone Company, and later Verizon. Now we're just going to head down to Wellwyn Road and go see the post office. The 
The Great Neck Post Office was built in 1939, designed by architects William Dewey Foster and Lewis Simon in the Art Deco and Classical style. It has served as Great Neck's main postal facility ever since and has been designated a landmark by the village of Great Neck Plaza. Above the entrance, the building features a relief sculpture of an eagle with 13 stars added in 1940. Now we're going to go down this way to the LIRR station. When train service began along Long Island in 1866, Greenwich was the end of the line. The land for the train station was built upon lands donated by Daniel T. Smith in 1864. In 1883, the station was rebuilt in wood, adding an apartment for the station master and his family. In 1925, the station was rebuilt by Ernest L. Smith in an English style at a cost of $50,000. In 1930, the train tracks were lowered, adding a pedestrian bridge and a set of stairs. This was done to allow traffic to flow more easily, as the original train tracks were level with the roads. The Grace Building, recognizable by its octagonal tower with the Dancing Man, was originally constructed in 1913 by industrialist William Russell Grace, who was the first Roman Catholic mayor of New York City. Grace was a very influential Granite resident who envisioned a community of businessmen and celebrities from New York City supported by working class shopkeepers and service workers. The building was built three and a half stories tall and originally served as location for stores and offices, with developers eventually adding residential apartments. Designed by architect James O'Connor, the building reflects English influences. Now we're going to head over to the two cinemas up there. The Squire Theatre opened under United Artists on January 15, 1941 as a small single screen cinema with its primary focus on movies. Over the years, renovations transformed the cinema, developing it into a seven screen theatre. Ownership also shifted, moving from, clear, from United Artists to Clear Roo Cinemas to Bowtie Cinemas and eventually to an independent operator. However, it was forced to close in the COVID pandemic and the nail in the coffin was in September of 2020 when the closure was announced to be permanent. Next, we're gonna look across the street to the Playhouse Theater, which, which was this rival competitor over the years. The Playhouse was built in 1922 by a man by the name of David Barron, making once the oldest theater in Great Neck. Its first play, Straight Shooter, starring George Abbott, premiered in 1925. The establishment was frequented by the Great Neck social elite of the time, among which were Walter Chrysler and the Hammerstein Brothers. Many famous figures also performed at the theater, such as the Marx Brothers and Eddie Cantor. It originally had a seating capacity of 1,500 and a marvelous stage, and it's, in its early years, it showcased plays from Broadway or ones that were bound for Broadway. However, by the 1930s, the playoffs had succumbed to the ever-growing popularity of the movies, shifting its focus, and by 1941, there's new competition, the Squire. These factors caused the theater to hobble along over the years, closing eventually in 1983. Theater was eventually raised and local businesses took its place. Thank you to Layla Matson and Jay Manks of the Granite Historical Society and Christy Okur of the Granite Library. I hope you enjoyed the tour.